Welcome to the TEDx Dayton stage, Gary Klein. Several years ago, I added a new slide to the talks that I gave on how people make decisions. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I'm a cognitive psychologist. I study how people make tough decisions under time pressure and uncertainty. Historically, decision researchers look at the kinds of errors and biases that people make that get in the way of good decisions. My research is just the opposite. I look at our strengths. I look at the ways we can use our experience. And so the new slide was basically a blend of those two factors. Two arrows, this is really a very simple slide. There's something you've got to reduce, that's the down arrow. You've got to reduce errors, no doubt about that. But that's not enough. You don't want to go home at night and say, I had a great day, I didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> You're hoping for more than that. And that's the up arrow. You want to uh, increase your achievements, your accomplishments, you want to have more insights. You want to do both of those things. Audiences resonated to the two slides. People would say, my organization, they're all about the down arrow. That's all they care about, cutting mistakes. And that's what I expected. What I didn't expect was the next question that I'd get. What can you tell us about the up arrow? Where do insights come from? And I'd say, I don't have any idea. And they didn't find that a very satisfying answer, and I didn't find that a very satisfying answer. So it was time to investigate the up arrow. It was time to try to find out where insights come from. Insights are unexpected discoveries about how things work and how to make them work better. Examples would be Watson and Crick figuring out that DNA if it w could work as a double helix to create life and replication. Wilbur Wright discovering that if he could change the angle of the wings on his flying machine while it was flying, he and Orville could swoop through the air and change directions and swoop through the air like birds. Those are the kinds of insights that I have in mind, as well as many minor insights that happen to us all the time. Insights are unexpected, they come without warning, but they've got to come from somewhere. So I decided to try to see if I could figure out where they came from. I put together a sample of 120 insights. I collected them from magazine articles, I collected them from books, from old interviews I had done with experts in different domains. And I tried to find a single common theme that would explain insights. And I failed. I couldn't come up with one theme. Instead, I came up with three different pathways. One of the pathways was when we try to solve something, try to achieve a goal, and we hit a block, an impasse, and we don't know how we can get out of it, and we break our heads, and then if we're lucky, all of a sudden it dawns on us, here's the answer. I'll give you an example. Nine dot problem. Task is connect the nine dots using four lines without ever lifting the paper, your pen from the paper. This is a very hard problem. If I gave you a half hour, most of you wouldn't be able to solve it. Some of you would. Some of you would realize what the answer was because the answer is pretty straightforward. There's a way to solve it. So what stops us? What gets in our way? Well, for this kind of an impasse problem, this pathway, we make unnecessary assumptions that trap us. We assume that we're supposed to keep the lines within the boundaries, but that's not a requirement. And we assume we can only change direction of the lines on a dot, and that's not a requirement. So we make unnecessary assumptions that get in our way. Some researchers have noticed that and said, let's come up with critical thinking exercises to overcome this problem with unnecessary assumptions. Let's have you, when you start a project, list all the assumptions that you're making. And it sounds reasonable. But it's not, because the assumptions that we're making with the nine dot problem 
they're unconscious assumptions. We're not even aware that, they're make, that we're making them. And it's very hard to write down unconscious assumptions. At least I have trouble doing it. <laughs> so this is the first pathway. This is the first pathway to insight is about creative desperation. You're stuck and you're trying to figure out some creative way to reach an, an insight. The second pathway is about connections, seeing that pieces work together. Simple example is Charles Darwin in the 1830s, collects all kinds of examples from different species, and he's wondering, where do these variations come from? And what keeps them going? Why do some keep going and others don't? And then one day he reads a book by Malthus about population growth and competition for scarce resources. And Darwin thinks, that's it, survival of the fittest. That's the engine that drives this process of species variation, and he has his theory of evolution. So he's putting different ideas together to form a new model, a new idea. Some people look at that and say, okay, so this is all about connecting the dots. I hate the metaphor of connecting the dots. <laughs> it simplifies and trivializes what we do. It makes it sound like we're in kindergarten, this dot and that dot, and oh, it's a bunny, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> what it misses is the front part. Okay, so this is a dot, and that's a dot, unless it's the same dot at a different time. And is this a dot, or is it a smudge? And this could be a dot, but I'm not sure it's related to the, in other words, there's a lot of noise at the beginning that you have to sort through. And if you eliminate the noise and just leave the actual dots, in hindsight, it looks like you're connecting the dots, but that's not what you're doing. So this is the second path. Third path that I found is about contradictions, where you see the pieces don't fit together. I'll give you an example. A police officer sitting in his car, waiting for the light to turn. Car in front of him is a brand new BMW. Officer watches the driver take a drag on his cigarette. Flick the ashes, and the officer thinks, who flicks the ashes in your brand new BMW? Or one that you borrowed, to, if you borrowed from your friend, would you do that? <laughs> this doesn't seem to make sense. Lights him up, pulls him over, sure enough, it's a stolen car. Okay, so, now I think you can see why I couldn't come up with one pathway. The connection path, is how we put ideas together. The contradiction path is seeing that ideas don't fit together. The creative desperation path, you're looking for a belief or an assumption that you can get rid of. The connection path, you're looking to add a new belief that will give you a richer notion. The creative desperation path is all inside. What beliefs do I have that are getting in my way? The contradiction path is outside. What am I seeing that doesn't make sense with everything that I know? So these three paths seem to work in their own dynamic. And so now, when people ask me where do insights come from, I can point to that model and say, this is what gives rise to insights. And that should have satisfied people, but it didn't. Then they asked me the question, naturally, all right, so we see where insights come from. How can we get more insights? What advice can you give us about finding more, making more discoveries and gaining more insights? And again, I wasn't expecting that question. I had no idea, but they seemed keen on trying to come up with some advice. So I decided I would give it a shot really irritated with myself that I ever used that slide with the up and down arrows. <laughs> so what I did was I went into my sample of 120 insights to see if there was any clue that I could use. This time, though, I wasn't looking for a common path. 
because a common path in this situation wouldn't really help us very much. Let's say, and this is really trivial, let's say I found everybody in my sample had cereal with their breakfast. Okay, could I say, here, I, I've solved the problem. This is what you need to do, have cereal with your breakfast. No, because there are a lot of people who have cereal with their breakfast and go on to have no insights at all for the next several hours. <laughs> Not gonna work. So instead, I went through the 120 insights, and I found a group of 30 where there was a comparison. And the 30 cases had one person who had the insight, a real person, and a second person, also a real person, who had all the same information and didn't come up with the insight. So now I had a natural comparison, and I could see what distinguished between the two of them. And what I found was, the person who had the insight had an active, curious mindset. They were wondering about things, unexpected things, unusual things. They enjoyed playing with ideas. They enjoyed speculating. That was just the way their head worked. People who didn't have the insight were very heads down. Let's get the job done. Don't bother me with distractions. Keep everything simple. Don't give me some new hypothetical ideas that might not work. A novel idea, good chance it's going to fail. Let's stick to the game plan. So that was the difference between the two groups. Based on that difference, I think I may have an idea for how you can increase insights. And I haven't tested it. This is pure speculation. But you might want to try it. The idea is simply to try to get yourself into the mindset, into the frame of, of thinking of having an active, curious mindset about the things that occur around you rather than go about your work mindlessly following the routines. It's a mindset that seems as if it might promote insights. How can you do this? I have four suggestions. First suggestion, make insights a habit part of your repertoire. When we um, miss a connection, we kick ourselves. Why didn't I notice that? Or if there's an anomaly and we don't pick it up until it's too late, what an idiot we are. And we're, we're, we're critical of ourselves. But even at that time, we've made discoveries. We're smarter than we were before. Give yourself credit for, even in hindsight, having the insight. And also, there are times when you do notice connections in time. You do spot anomalies that change your behavior. So you are having insights, but you don't notice them. We tend to just shrug them off or go, or go, go on, not give them much attention. Well, notice them. Celebrate them. That's how to make them part of your repertoire. Some people have suggested maybe you should Keep a log of your insights. And I think that would be fun. I think it would be uh, informative. But most of you aren't going to keep logs. I know that. But you can at least notice and appreciate the insights that you have more th than you're currently doing. Second thing you can do is use your curiosity. What should you be curious about? That is anything that comes up that's unusual or unexpected or catches your attention. And you want, instead of saying, I'm too busy, give it a few seconds and wonder about it. And if you need more direction than that, back to this model. You could be curious about the assumptions you're making. Are they really important? Do you need all of them? Maybe you should re-examine them. You could be curious about coincidences. Instead of saying, that's just a coincidence, a mere coincidence, maybe it is. But sometimes coincidences put us on the road to connections. So give it some thought. What's going on underneath there? Contradictions, anomalies. Most of them are just irrelevant, and you explain them away. But then you don't get any insights. And so you see an anomaly. Sometimes you may want to spend a few seconds. What is that anomaly telling us? That guy who flicked his ashes in his new BMW. What's that all about? and give it a few seconds thought about what might be happening. The idea here is to, to try to uh, 
use your curiosity more effectively. The third step is to try to encourage other people and uh, get them to um, generate insights. And there's ways of doing that. If you have progress reviews, you ask for time and schedule, ask them what surprised you since the last time we talked. And if they say, nothing surprised me, everything is fine, you don't have to worry, that's when you need to worry. <laughs> the fourth step is irritations, confusions, and contradictions and conflicts, the things that irritate us. They irritate us, but we can still use them. I'll give you an example. I was once putting on a seminar on leadership and the difficulty of explaining vision. And one person in the seminar said, I know just what you mean. I had somebody, I brought him into my office, I gave him a task, he understood it, out he went, brought him back a few days later, he went in the wrong direction. I totally missed it up. And I said, before you sent him out, did you ask him, what did you think I wanted? And he said, no, why would I do that? Why would you do that? You might learn something. Maybe he had a bad idea, or maybe uh, your instructions weren't as clear, and he had a valid interpretation, even if it wasn't the one you wanted. And so the idea here is to try to take on this active, curious mindset that might bring you into a world of possibilities. We know we need to reduce errors. That's valuable in itself, but sometimes like, people like to reduce errors because they don't want to be blamed. It didn't go well, but I followed all the steps. It's not my fault. That's playing not to lose. I think you can do better. I think you can play to win. Good luck. <laughs>